Good morning, everybody. As we get started, I'd like to recognize somebody this morning. He was named this week the Citizen of the Year by the Boy Scouts of America. David Lockton, would you please stand up? You know, a recurring dream that I have and many other ministers have is that we're at church and everything is disorganized, nothing is going right, and people are getting frustrated and getting up and starting to leave. And I'm reacting to it by, by yelling at people and trying to get things in more of an order and, and they won't go. And it's it just, it, about every six months it happens. And so you wake up and you feel just distraught. And when I, uh, I heard that there was 2,008 ballots in the audience, I got that same feeling sitting there. I thought, oh my God, what is going on here? Um, is anybody leaving? Now on the upper side, we try to look things at a, in a positive viewpoint. On the upper side, for those of you that don't like organized religion, this is a heyday for you. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> Well, this is the third part of an eight-part series on the book called Ask Yourself This. And each week we pose a question, and as we go through the lesson, we come up with an answer, an answer that can help us uh, grow personally, uh, an answer that can help increase the peace and the harmony and the love in our lives. And the question today is, how do I grow personally? And that's a good question. How do we do that? Well, to grow personally is to increase in your life those things of a spiritual or an emotional nature. Now let me repeat that. To grow personally is to increase the degree in your life of those things that you value, like love, peace, happiness, harmony, all of those things. When we increase those things, we grow personally. So the second question that comes about, well, how do we do that? How do we go about increasing all those things that we value? I mean, we value love, and we should have an abundance of love in our lives if we value confidence or harmony or any of those, those great spiritual attributes that we have, we should be able to do that. To find out how, we go back some 2,000 years and we look at the teachings of Jesus. Now, the Bible and scholars tell us that Jesus was about 28 years old when he started his ministry. And at that time, tradition, solid tradition, stated that a son would work with his father when the father retired, the son would continue in that trade and support the family. So you can imagine the look in Joseph's face. Jesus, 28 years old, comes to him and says, Dad, I'm going to quit working with you. I'm going to travel around the countryside. I'm going to teach people how to live. And Joseph probably said, well, what is this pay? Oh, it doesn't pay anything. Well, how are you going to survive? I don't know. Imagine the look in Joseph's face when he heard that. It'd be just like the look in your face if your parents and one of your children came and said that, I'm going to quit my job and ramble around the country. But he did that. His intention was to increase those things that people valued. He had risen into a higher level of consciousness. He realized that there was an abundance of love, that there was an abundance of peace, there was an abundance of of harmony and joy in the potential of every single person, and his intention was to help them experience that. Now, during these times, <clears throat> the people were somewhat downtrodden. They had financial problems, they had health problems, there were political issues, there were all sorts of other issues that created anxiety and fear and worry and concerns. And so they were an unhappy lot. They had a lot of tension in their lives. You know, they weren't that much different from us, if you stop and think about it. We face problems, big problems. But Jesus' point was, his intention was that that is just life happening, and that doesn't have to lower, or it doesn't have to depreciate all those things in life that are yours. So he and the disciples went off on the ministry. Now, first of all, he faced a lot of problems because of the tradition that he broke from family. He recruited the disciples, and they felt that same kind of, of resistance from their family and parents. Then he met with problems from the church. The religious leaders saw him as some sort of a, a renegade 
sacrilegious, somebody that was undermining their power and a threat to the position that they held. And oftentimes when he'd go to different towns to do his preaching, the religious leaders in those towns would turn the people against him. They'd run him out of town and actually even throw stones at him. So the question is, how come 2,000 years later, we're sitting here talking about the ministry of Jesus? Why did he continue, first of all, and second of all, why was it a success? Well, the reason for that was that he had a very effective method for turning people's lives around and allowing them to experience the most that they possibly could. And the first thing he did is he told the people, he said, what do you value in life? What are your true values? You have to determine those. If you want more love in your life, that's something you value. If you want more peace in your life, more self-confidence, more calmness, whatever it is you value, you have to determine that. And then he said the second thing that you have to do is set your intention. When you get up in the morning, your intention is to increase or to create that which you value in your life. And each and every one of us has the potential to do that. So everything was going along fine, but when they went into different towns, and the people met them with a, not only a resistant attitude, but, but many times with a great deal of wrath, the disciples became very irritated. They became angry. They doubted the ministry. They probably wished that they wouldn't have joined up in the first place. So Jesus had a problem. He thought, set your intention on your values that will increase in your life, but... It wasn't happening. So the third point was to increase their response ability. Two words, response ability. Our ability to respond. And that's what the lesson is about today. Each and every one of us lives a life we have a myriad of activities going on around us. We have problems and challenges that we face. But we still have those things in abundance that we value if we set our intention on creating them. There's not a single person here who sets the intention that I want more love in my life that can't go out of this church at 11.30 today and create more love in your world. But the problem is the same thing that Jesus and the disciples face is when we run into those problems that stir us up, we run into those problems that make us angry, it's our response to the activity in the world. Now here we come to a point that's very, very important. We live in a very fast-paced world. It's oftentimes chaotic and confusing. Myriad of activities swirling around you every single day. But nothing happens, nothing happens in your life until you respond to those activities. You can move into the most chaotic situation, you can move into the most, uh, run into the most disgruntled person, but nothing happens until you respond to that activity. And so what Jesus was teaching the disciples and the people of his day is to increase that ability of your response. And make sure that in every single position that you're in, that your response coordinates with your intention, which is in alignment with that which you value. Very, very simple lesson. It's setting your values, setting your intention, and then making sure that your response is in alignment with them.